with that, um, I believe I am through talking to you. And uh, I am thrilled to introduce our keynote this morning, uh, Eva Galperin. I think she uh, is probably someone many of you are familiar with, and I'm going to let her fully introduce herself. Um, she's a woman who wears many hats. So uh, I think, here we go. Thanks a lot. Have fun. Good morning. Thank you so much, everyone, for getting up so early. I have come here from the West Coast, and I usually go to bed around. I'm going to go with now. Um, so if I'm not entirely awake, please understand. Fortunately, there are some things that I can do, even in my sleep. Uh, and that includes being really, really angry about spouse wear and stalker wear. Uh, so let's start by making slides go. My name is Eva Galpern, and I'm the director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with EFF? A few people, one or two, three or four. This is good. It saves me a lot of time. Uh, I like it when I don't have to explain what we do. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is, uh, we are a digital civil liberties organization uh, based out of San Francisco. And our job is to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. So there are a bunch of ways that we can go about this. Uh, and you know, in, in the same way that the, the internet is, is global and its problems are global and they require a fairly uh, broad toolkit uh, if you want to deal with them. So the, the tools that we have in our toolkit are, uh, we have uh, lawyers. Uh, I have an entire floor of angry attack lawyers uh, in, in the US and sometimes we file lawsuits. We do uh, what is called impact litigation. Uh, the purpose of impact litigation to protect digital civil liberties is uh, not just to file lawsuits that protect the people who are involved in the lawsuit, but that lawsuits that will create good precedent or uh, get rid of bad precedent. Uh, so. That's what our lawyers are for. Uh, sometimes the situation calls for activists. You have to get people out in the streets. You need to get people angry. They need to sign petitions. They need to wave signs around. Uh, so we have an entire floor of angry activists. Uh, and then uh, sometimes the answer is uh, to throw engineers at the problem. And so uh, we also have an entire floor of angry engineers. Uh, oh, oh, dear. <laughs> <sighs> I am one such angry engineer. <laughs> there we go, who has managed to mess everything up. So, uh, we also have a floor of angry engineers. I have my own team of angry engineers uh, called EFF's Threat Lab, and uh, we are particularly concerned about privacy and security for vulnerable populations all over the world. So not just like your average user, but uh, activists, journalists, uh, women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ populations, and uh, you know, people in uh, abusive uh, relationships, as it turns out, is among those uh, the people that we uh, are helping out in Threat Lab. Uh, when I started Threat Lab, I sat my people down and I said, okay, everybody pick an industry that you want to destroy. And this is the story of the industry that I decided to destroy. Where do we go from here? So, uh, the first thing that we need to talk about in order to sort of get to the area of spouse wear and stalker wear is first, we must go back in time. Do -do 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 uh, to 2017, or like I call it, the before time. Uh, in 2017, I was a security researcher. I uh, mostly did work on, uh, on APTs, uh, Advanced Persistent Threats, which is uh, what we call uh, especially annoying governments. And I specialized in the sort of, you know, 
B team of governments. Uh, when I first started doing my work in 2011, uh, most discussion of APTs centered around uh, the Five Eyes and China and Russia and Israel, and there wasn't really thought to be a whole lot of other game in town. Uh, and because these uh, APTs were particularly sophisticated, there was a lot of research about them because they're interesting. Um, but around 2010 and 2011, we started to see uh, a rise in, uh, in lower level APTs. Uh, so uh, Vietnam, uh, Kazakhstan, Lebanon, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and these were countries that were essentially just buying software from, uh, it turned out, uh, software that was often built in Western countries, uh, like the UK and Germany and, uh, as it later turns out, Israel. Um, and that way they didn't have to, you know, roll a bunch of their own infrastructure, they didn't have to train up a whole bunch of their own people, it was sort of like, turnkey uh, surveillance. And this was uh, one of the big things that we started to see happening around, uh, around 2011 when I started doing my security research. So I spent years publishing security research on you know, Syria and Vietnam and Lebanon uh, with a guy who turned out uh, in 2017 to be a serial rapist. So I got mad. I got really, really angry, and I didn't know what to do, and I did what most angry people do on the internet when they don't know what to do. I, um, I tweeted, and I tweeted that if you are a woman who has been sexually abused by a hacker who threatened to compromise your devices, you can contact me, and I will make sure that they are properly examined. Now, the reason I sent out this specific tweet was uh, that I had just read an article with an interview with one of this guy's victims. And the journalist asked the, asked the victim, well, what took you so long to come forward? Why, why did you spend you know, years not telling anybody uh, that, that you'd been raped by this guy? And she said, I mean, never mind that this is some like, stupid victim blaming, but what she said was, he was a hacker and he threatened to compromise my devices. I was really worried about what he was going to do to me. And I was so mad, and I didn't want anybody to ever feel that way again. Hence, tweeting. Uh, what I did not foresee was this. Uh, that's 9,463 retweets, 16,339 likes. Uh, so that kind of went viral. Uh, and it would go viral once every few months. So it would, uh, it would make the rounds on Facebook. It made the rounds on Tumblr before the great porn ban, and now Tumblr is just tumbleweeds. Um, and so I would get messages all the time. And I was swamped. I was getting somewhere between uh, zero and a dozen contacts a day, depending on whether or not my, uh, this message was currently going viral. Um, and every day I would go into my inbox and I would have a dozen stories of people telling me about the worst thing that ever happened to them. Uh, the victims were mostly women, uh, abusers were mostly men, but I also dealt with cases of women abusing men and of abusive same-sex couples. Uh, one man who came to me had been outed as gay uh, by, his, uh, by his former boyfriend, who is extremely conservative uh, Korean family, uh, which was super upsetting. So I saw many different kinds of abuse, and it was really disturbing. But for the most part, these people who thought that their devices had been compromised were wrong. Uh, most people didn't need forensics. Um, sometimes they uh, were the victims of a scam. I don't know how many of you had seen the uh, email, scam emails going around saying, I, have, you know, I installed a you know, malware on your computer, and I have seen you looking at porn and masturbating through your... Um, uh, you know, through your computer, and I have recorded this, and I'm going to send it out to all of your contacts, you bad, bad person, you. Uh, so this was making the rounds, and I got a lot of people coming to me saying, I got this email, and I could tell them, you know, this is a scam, done. 
Uh, sometimes it was not a scam, but most often it was uh, account compromise. So people had their, uh, their email accounts compromised, their Google Drives compromised, their Facebook accounts compromised, their Twitter accounts compromised, Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp. Apple IDs, everything. If you could think of it, uh, somebody, has, uh, somebody has compromised it, and now they have pictures or, or are sending messages or in some other way uh, harassing a person. Um, and for me, this is actually kind of good news because we can do something about account compromise. We have, we have solutions for account compromise. You send them to go look at who's been logging into their accounts. You tell them, get a password manager, use it correctly, uh, have strong, unique passwords, use security questions as more passwords, use the highest level of two-factor authentication that's feasible for you. So we have a lot of answers for securing your account. And that makes my job a lot easier. But sometimes it really is a rat. Um, and those were the most disturbing cases. Uh, I see only a small fraction of the cases that actually exist in the wild. And this is partly because the kind of person who threatens to hack their victim usually doesn't. Uh, it turns out those people are cowards uh, and also lazy. Uh, and the kind of abuser who has a rat on their victim's device often keeps quiet about it in order to maintain access. Um, abusers lie about their capabilities all the time. Uh, it helps keep the victims feeling confused and powerless uh, when they don't know the shape and the limits of their, um, of their abuser's surveillance. So it's a really, really powerful tool with, even when it's not being deployed. Um, but I did occasionally see rats, and those were the most disturbing cases because uh, those were cases in which people got, uh, they got new phones, they got new computers, they kept, switching, uh, they kept switching accounts, they kept switching their passwords, and evidence of compromise kept persisting, and they didn't know how to get rid of it. So here I am getting all of these, uh, getting all of these messages, and uh, I'm kind of exhausted, um, but I feel great. I get to be a hero. I am Captain Marvel. Uh, every, every day people come to me and they say, you're, you're doing extremely important heroic work. I have a profile uh, ab about me written by Wired in which I'm looking off into the distance like a thought leader. And, um, but I'm also really tired and I don't scale. Uh, and the hero thing is bullshit. Uh, having just one person doing forensics on people's computers one at a time, holding their hands, talking to them about you know, try, trying to kind of distinguish between account compromise and device compromise is not scalable. It's not a good use of my time. Uh, and it is honestly like not so great for my mental health. Uh, so the hero model feels really good, but the hero model is bullshit. So, I'm lazy, and I started thinking about this in, in a sort of more EFF-y way, uh, in the same way that the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, does impact litigation. I started to think about how we could do you know, some impact activism, impact engineering, uh, punching above our weight, so that it's, it's not just one person doing the work of, uh, of talking to one person at a time, uh, because even though that feels good, it's dumb. Uh, so, because I am lazy, I have decided to engage in some thought leadership. Um, so I had advice from people with compromised accounts, uh, but the worst abuses were definitely compromised devices, mostly Android phones running spouseware and stalkerware. Um, the spouseware and stalkerware would hand over uh, emails, text messages, WhatsApp messages, photos, Snapchats, uh, all your Instagram messages, web browsing searches. Basically, having access to somebody's phone is tempting to an abuser for the same reason that it's tempting to a, uh, to a state actor, uh, which is that access to somebody's phone is the next best thing to access to somebody's mind. Uh, if you want to know where someone is going, what they're doing, what they're thinking, breaking into their phone is a pretty damn quick way to do it. Um, 
And so I started looking at the spouseware and stalkerware industry as a whole. Um, so the good news is that investigating spouseware and stalkerware is a lot easier than investigating APTs. Um, APTs don't usually advertise on Google. Uh, and because this is, uh, these are all commercial products, um, I had the easiest time in the world. Just Google, how do I spy on my girlfriend? How do I spy on my boyfriend? How do I catch a cheating spouse? Uh, and results come up, lots of results. Uh, and so that's where I started. And I started to see the language that they use around, uh, around their products. Uh, for example, uh, access to Coco Spy gives you the lead on how to spy on your wife with ease. You don't have to worry about where she goes, who she talks to, or the websites she visits. I mean, never mind, you didn't have to worry about those things in the first place. But uh, this, is the, this is kind of the way that they frame it. You get peace of mind by spying on your wife. It's totally reasonable. Who wouldn't want to do that? Peace of mind sounds very soothing. Um, the other way in which these, uh, these things are frequently framed is that oh, cheating, cheating happens all the time. You, you need to spy on your spouse in order to, to catch that no good man or woman or person of, of your preferred gender uh, cheating on you. Uh, what is particularly interesting about this picture, aside from that it is a man holding a woman uh, with a black eye and possibly blood on her face, is that this, um, this article is on the side of the man. The whole point of this article is that cheating happens all the time, and so what you really need to do is you need to spy on your wife so you can catch her and then beat her up. That is what these products are for. And the way that they often work is uh, that you buy a subscription. So uh, the first thing you do is you Google, how am I going to catch my cheating wife? Then you uh, pay them some money. You download uh, the, um, the APK onto the phone that you're, that you're going to spy on. And then you log into a portal. You buy access to a portal which is, uh, which is run by the company that has sold you the product. And as long as you pay your subscription, you have access to the portal and therefore the contents of whatever is going on on, uh, on the phone. So it's not just that these companies are, uh, are possibly writing spyware or that they're advertising spyware. It is that they are taking money in order to continuously give you access uh, to this data. And why do we think this sort of thing is okay? Well, uh, there's actually sort of a, a long history in, in hacker culture of, uh, of drawing a distinction between spying on your spouse and uh, like nation state attackers. So uh, this is uh, Jean-Pierre Lesseur. Uh, he is a French hacker who it, uh, around 2011, 2012, uh, had a project called Dark Comet. So Dark Comet was a, uh, a free rat that anybody could download, and it turned out that it was being used a lot by at least two groups that were sympathetic to, uh, to the Assad regime in uh, the sort of early stages of the, of the Syrian civil war. So we're starting, we were starting to see these uh, rats being used uh, to target... Um, people who were opposed to Assad, who would then get visits from the security services, who would then be sent to uh, prisons and tortured and possibly killed. So we had these like very distinct links all the way from this free rat to people dying in Syria, and that was really disturbing. And uh, Jean-Pierre Lesseur shut the project down. Uh, he basically said that he never meant for people to use his free rat in this way, uh, that it was not okay for it to be used by, uh, by pro-Assad regime forces, that he didn't want uh, people in, in Syria getting hurt. Uh, the uh, Wired coverage of this was hilariously sympathetic. Uh, the title of the, of the Wired article that was written about him was how the boy next door accidentally built a Syrian spy tool. But 
the subtext behind all this is that, oh sure, you can't have you know pro pro Syrian uh, you know pro pro Assad people uh, using this to spy on uh, on enemies of the Assad regime, but if some dude wants to use it to spy on his cheating girlfriend, that's fine. Go to town. That's that's entirely legit. And uh, for a very long time, just no one called bullshit on this attitude. So how do you know if it's spouseware? Because uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of software out there. And sometimes it is framed as, uh, so you run a business and you want to uh, see what your, uh, what your employees are doing. Uh, you give your employees a, a phone, you want to make sure that they're not you know, doing anything illegal on it. Uh, you want to make sure that there are like, no leaks from your organization. Uh, you are a parent and you want, to, uh, you want to keep track of your child. Uh, so maybe you might want to use these tools. So these are, these are other things that you might want to do uh, with, uh, with sort of tracking software for people's phones. And most of these are legitimate uses. So how can we tell the difference between, between these kinds of legitimate uses and uh, spouseware slash stalkerware? Uh, deception. Uh, if the software is designed to run in such a way that the user does not see it on the device, if it's meant to deceive the uh, person who has the device into thinking that there is no spyware on the phone, then that's spouseware or stalkerware. And we can argue about whether or not it's illegal, but I am here to tell you that it's unethical as hell. Uh, now, this also includes uh, situations in which in order to install the software, you need to have uh, the device's login credentials. Uh, for a very long time, companies believed that if you had physical access to the device and you had, say, the Apple ID and, uh, and the password, then that is legitimate access to somebody's phone. Um, and I'm here to tell you that that's not how abuse works. Uh, it is extremely common in abusive situations for the abuser to have physical access uh, to his partner's phone and uh, to have the password and the username which they have compelled out of, uh, out of their partner. So that's really not enough uh, to count as legitimate access anymore. And this is one of those cases in which uh, essentially our threat modeling is wrong. We did not take into account uh, abusive partners in abusive situations, and we thought, oh, certainly there's never going to be a case where you just give away your password to somebody who, you know, doesn't mean well. So I went ahead to, you know, I went up over to Virus Total after having downloaded a bunch of, uh, a bunch of spouseware, and I went to see how, uh, how the various antivirus companies treat this software. And I've discovered uh, back in, I, I think that this is from a few months ago, this is from like April, um, I discovered that detection rates were very low. Not only are detection rates quite low, but for the most part, uh, AV companies largely uh, ignore stalkerware and spouseware. Um, because it has some legitimate uses in, in their eyes. Uh, here we have more examples. I believe this is a copy of the Truth Spy that I was, uh, that I was looking for. And as you can see, uh, we had uh, 10, uh, 10 AV companies were able to detect it, and that's out of 61. So that's pretty damn disappointing. What are these security researchers even doing with their time? So I, uh, I went to the AV industry, and um, I managed to convince a couple of companies to start treating um, spouseware as malicious, to start marking it and say, like, this is spouseware, this is stalkerware, uh, I see it on your phone, here, possibly I can remove it. Uh, it shouldn't remove it automatically, because uh, I am very much in favor of making sure that the, that the user uh, is able to make an informed decision. Uh, and also because there may be some cases where uh, removing the spouseware from the phone may cause the abuser to escalate uh, to either violence or greater violence than they're already engaged in. So I'm, I'm all about marking it rather than, uh, rather than just sort of nuking it from orbit uh, because that 
decision really needs to be made by uh, by the victim. So this is the privacy alert that uh, that Kaspersky put out. Uh, this is this is how they mark uh, spouseware and uh, and stalkerware now. Um, but not everybody is down for installing Kaspersky products on their devices for some strange reason. Uh, and so they were so soon joined by Lookout. Lookout put out a statement that was like, oh yeah, stalkerware and spouseware, we've always been doing that. Uh, we, we've always been at war with, uh, with East South Asia. Um, so Lookout also does this, and I'm very happy that now I have alternatives. Uh, we, have, uh, we have two companies that are treating stalkerware and spouseware in the way that I think that they should be. Um, but I think that what we really need to see is uh, this needs to become the new normal. Uh, there are there were what like 61 companies on virus total, and this is two, so uh, 59 to go. Uh, I'll wait here. So. Let's talk a little bit about what antivirus can do, because even in the cases where these products are legal, they're unethical, and AV should detect them. Um, again, AV should not automatically remove them, because victims should have a choice. Uh, there, I am worried about abusers escalating to violence, and uh, our first duty, which I have blatantly uh, stolen from the medical profession, is to first do no harm. Um, I am very excited that both Lookout and Kaspersky are doing this, uh, but there is so much work left to do. Uh, I do have AV companies reaching out to me saying, well, just like, give me a list of all the spouseware, and then we will just, you know, add it to our, uh, add it to our engine, and we will be done. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, not the right approach to the problem, because again, once more, we are relying on the hero model, where suddenly it's my job to maintain a list of stalkerware and spouseware for the entire AV industry to use. Um, I don't work for them. I'd be paid much better if I worked as an AV researcher than I do at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a non-for-profit organization uh, whose money comes entirely from 40,000 volunteers all over the world. Uh, and so what I would really like AV companies to do is to stay on top of it themselves and do their damn jobs. There are also some things that Google can do. Uh, Google could do a better job of policing the Google Play Store. It is already against uh, Google's terms of service for their Play Store uh, to have um, software which surreptitiously spies on you which does not appear uh, with a like large icon uh, on, on your dock showing you this is the thing which is running on your device. Uh, so having that uh, policed better would be uh, a tremendous relief to me. And finally, what can governments do? Uh, often when I tell people about a problem, the very first reaction that I get is, uh, there ought to be a law. Now, I am extremely skeptical of this because I have seen many bad laws. <laughs> I have seen many poorly written laws uh, used against security researchers, used against uh, journalists and activists and uh, people who really need to defend their privacy and uh, their anonymity and their speech. Uh, generally, if a law is written badly, uh, it is not going to get used against bad guys. It's going to get used against the most vulnerable populations, and those are the people that I protect all day. So I'm very skeptical when somebody says there ought to be a law. But it turns out that there are some laws, uh, and they already exist. Uh, this is a brief list of, uh, of US federal laws that apply. Uh, which I understand will be less interesting in Canada, but uh, this is a, when all you have is a hammer problem, which is to say that my hammer is a floor of angry US lawyers, uh, and so I do not have a uh, Canadian analysis of, uh, of what laws these guys are breaking. But uh, in the United States, uh, they may be uh, violating the Federal Wiretapping uh, Act, the FWA, uh, which generally uh, prohibits the interception of wire, oral, uh, or electronic communications. So if they're you know, spying on your, on your phone calls in real time. Uh, the Stored Communications Act, 
uh, again, uh, very, uh, this time when the, when the information is stored and then you pull it down. Uh, and finally, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which uh, is often used against, uh, against hackers, and so I'm very concerned about uh, overzealous prosecution of people under the CFAA. Um, but it is fairly clear that uh, what we're talking about here is, uh, does violate the CFAA and its, um, its prohibition on... Um, uh, I've totally lost it. Uh, anyway, it is a violation of the CFAA and it is bad. Uh, so the uh, Federal Wiretapping Act uh, prohibits the manufacture, distribution, possession, and advertising of certain interception devices. Uh, so it's not limited to the developers of, of uh, spyware. And uh, some courts have held that the maker of spyware installed on a computer used to intercept electronic communications uh, and send them to the company's server is itself guilty of the interception under the FWA, even though it was not the end user. Uh, and you can see uh, that in 2014, uh, the CEO of a company called Stealth Genie was indicted under uh, USC 2512. Uh, he pled guilty and was fined $500,000. Another spy, uh, spyware software was indicted, a uh, developer was indicted in 2005, uh, but he fled the country. And uh, prosecutions have also occurred uh, with respect to the end users of spyware. And uh, additionally, another tool that we have uh, at our disposal is the FTC. Uh, in 2012, the FTC charged Designerware LLC, a company that provided spyware to rent-to-own computer providers, and entered into a consent degree, decree with the company agreeing not to collect data from computers without giving clear and prominent notice and obtaining affirmative consent. Uh, in 2008, the FTC sued CyberSpy Software, which sold a keylogger program uh, the company entered into a consent decree with the FTC in 2012 in which it agreed not to promote, sell, or distribute software to be installed on computers without the knowledge or consent of the computer's owner. So it can be done. Um, additionally, there are state laws in the US, uh, such as uh, any, uh, any state wiretapping statutes, uh, states with two-party consent, where uh, recording a conversation without the consent of both parties is illegal. Uh, and uh, the Consumer Protection Against Consumer Spyware Act, which is sure specific, um, which exists in the great state of California, where I am from, uh, you may ask yourself, but maybe, maybe I'm a parent. Shouldn't I be allowed to spy on my children? Uh, and uh, while I have already answered that earlier in the, in the talk that uh, it's, it's unethical, um, it is kind of legal. So most courts have found that parents may vicariously consent on behalf of their minor children to record their child's oral, wire, or electronic communications, uh, which makes these interceptions legal under the Federal Wiretapping Act. Um, however, this is uh, not an unlimited power uh, the parent has to demonstrate a good faith, objectively reasonable basis for believing uh, that such consent was necessary for the welfare of the child. So it's not like a phenomenal cosmic power. Uh, so this is sort of my, my wrap up of all the different tools that we could possibly use to solve this problem. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about were a bunch of other people. So. I didn't invent the term spouseware or stalkerware. I think the first use of the term that I was able to find goes back to something like 2007. Um, I didn't even invent doing security research on spouseware or stalkerware. Uh, none of the work that I have done would have been possible if it was not for uh, the work of people like Harlow Holmes uh, at the... Um, the Freedom, the Freedom of Press Foundation, who has been working with, uh, with individuals on things like this for years. Uh, the work of journalists at, um, at Vice, especially Vice's motherboard uh, blog. This, uh, this blog actually has a series called When Spies Come Home, which is focused entirely on spouseware and, uh, and the stalkerware industry, uh, which 
you know, really saved me a lot of time in explaining what the hell this stuff is, and saved me an awful lot of research in trying to find uh, bad actors in the space. Uh, and there are also journalists like uh, Thomas Brewster, who works for Forbes, uh, who has also spent a lot of time uh, covering the spouseware and stalkerware industry. So we don't do this alone. Uh, we don't have to do it alone. And uh, the more people that we have looking into the way that, uh, that this stuff is being abused and pressuring companies uh, to take action, the faster we can stop this kind of abuse and we can change uh, we can change the norms around the use of spouseware and stalkerware. Thank you very much.